Hi everyone, Lars and Scott here from Camille's Harem, here again with another seasonal anime preview, and I have some need for weeb. Anyway, let's start talking about what's going to be continuing and returning this season, and then oh, move yeah. on to a bunch of the new stuff. Which, there's a lot of fan favorites continuing into this season. Oh yeah, absolutely. First off, one of the big ones, especially one that I've seen a lot of people talking about uh, on a lot of our uh, YouTube videos, has been Free Ren. Yes. Free Ren. Which has, which has captivated lots of people. With beautiful storytelling, a great character, fantasy done in a way where I think... Like, I've seen so many different stories that tackle, like, the idea of the immortal elves. They've got such long lifespans, and usually it's played off more as a joke than anything else. And here it's actually so crucial to the flow of the story and the adventures that Free Run goes on. And that's like, yeah, that, that's, that is how it should be told, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, Free Run's just a great story in the first place the characters are great the plot the motivations all that together just makes a great story so i'm excited to see where they're going to go with the second season mm -hmm. yeah and i mean and i'll say as of the recording of this right here i really need to binge free run i've just been so busy with christmas time and everything else like that i have kept up with a couple of the the shows that are actually here on the on our returning list, uh, so I haven't been entirely uh, shirking my duty. <laughs> right, Apothecary Diaries. I know you've been following that one, and I'm pretty much caught up with mm -hmm. the manga. Yeah, I've been really, really enjoying the Apothecary Diaries, and I'm really excited to see where it goes because as of the latest episode. Everything has changed in a really interesting way with Mau Mau returning to the Imperial Palace uh, after having her contract uh, bought out by Jinji. And, uh, and, and what I specifically like, like, I know that a lot of other people are like, oh my gosh, he bought her out, he loves her, or is this really creepy? Meanwhile, I'm like, wait a second right here. Mau Mau actually wants to return to the Imperial Palace, even before all of this happens, even though she knows kind of what this all entails. This says more to her growing as an individual, realizing like where she herself fits in, because she always fit in in the Red Light District, but now she actually wants to go back to the Imperial Palace, because there, her skills and her personality actually end up meshing way better with other people and uh, and like that's a that's a good realization for the kind of character that Mao Mao is because she's so intelligent and yet not in, in like in a, in a funny way not very self aware she's very aware of other people but not really of herself and this was like a good moment of like oh oh I'm learning something about myself. Well, so. and she's going back in a much better position. Basically, before she was like an indentured slave. And now she's going back as an actual employee for Jinchi. And just that change in relationship, that change in her own freedom status makes all the difference. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm, excited I'm excited to see where we go with that. Undead Unlocked. Uh, un I know we've had quite a few people talking about that in our comments. <laughs> yes, and I... Oh, my gosh. Undead Unluck is one that... I need to do uh, an analysis on because it years ago I did a video on Fooly Cooly and how to like write insane stories and I feel like Undead Unluck is a story that needs to be the continuation of that conversation right there because it's not Fooly Cooly levels of insanity but it is a story that is absolutely bonkers like if you stop and think about anything that's happening in Undead Unluck it's totally just going off the rails and yet it makes total sense within within the world that's been created for the story and that's something that i feel like is is very hard actually to pull off for a lot of writers there's it's a very difficult balance to maintain you're either too you're either playing it too safe or you're just so insane that you lose the audience. And Undead Unluck manages to hit that perfect balance. 
And then we've got the one I've been following, though I haven't made a video for it for a few weeks. Though there's a reason because of that. I haven't dropped the video series at all. But Shangri-La Frontier is getting a continuation, which is awesome, especially as the characters grow, like, in the video game setting anyway, like, level up. They're, the battles are just going to get more and more over the top. But I did realize something about Shangri-La Frontier from reading the manga recently, is that it's not necessarily about the games, even if the anime is named after the one specific game they're playing the most. It's about the characters. It's a character-driven drama, and Shangri-La Frontier just happens to be the setting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really fun story. A lot of fun action, a lot of fun, like, character shenanigans, just all that fun stuff. Oh, yeah. I just want to say, like, I, I love the fact that on our list of returning... We had like that that we had that we have four. We have four anime right here, which are basically getting the traditional twenty-four episode treatment. I know that they're calling them first and second core, but effectively they're getting the twenty-four episode treatment of just a full season. Yeah. Right here. And I love that we are seeing that because I think that actually keeps these shows way more in people's memories in the zeitgeist. And I think it also just shows the strength of having that 24 episode block for certain stories. Um, and I like I feel that uh, Konosuba has actually uh, suffered from not being just given like a 24 episode season where you could just get all of that insanity and those shenanigans and really have it land and stick around. Uh, I agree. Uh, I have and, heard and, of another season for Konosuba coming out pretty soon. Yeah, and that's and that's, and that's, and that's a good, good that's a good thing. thing but I just feel like it's just what like Konosuba and there's other shows as well that have just kind of been lost in the shuffle. And when they come back, people are going to be really surprised and excited. But uh, but it but because of just the constant shuffle, so many anime, and you're only getting twelve episodes, thirteen at best, things are just really quickly watched and then discarded. 24 episodes, if, the, if it can be managed, I feel like that is the way to go for anime. Yes. Let's see. Then we have Mashley, which is another... <laughs> can I call it fight porn? Yeah, yeah if you want to. <laughs> it's basically what it is. And like slapstick comedy. I, I, I enjoyed watching Mashley so much because in so many ways it's so bad but it knows it is and it just and it revels in it and i love it i i i am going to do that how to write magical academies video i am going to do it and mashley is going to be one of the examples that i tear it <laughs> i'm looking forward to that then i'm looking forward to and we were just talking about before we started this recording is Tsukimichi Moonlight Fantasy, which it's been a manga I've been following for years. It's been one of the three main isekai that like I've loved since I started reading them. And so I'm excited about that one. And I can definitely tell Japanese audience loves it too, even though it's kind of under the radar here in the States. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes this uh, the, this newest season. But this definitely. Then this was something we were talking about before we began recording. Is that is that the fact that you have Moonlight Fantasy coming back again, even though it flew under the radar here in the West? It just goes to show that the Japanese do things differently than how we would expect right here. I think there's a lot of Western viewers who are a little bit like, hi, am I like, we are the ones who are bringing all of this light and views and popularity to these shows. But most Japanese studios don't really care. They're catering to the Japanese audience. And if it does well abroad, fantastic, more money for them. But uh, they, they know their audience and uh, uh, Tsukamichi really is a great example of that. And then I think the only one that's not fantasy kind of setup. I mean, Shangri La is like sci fi, if anything. Mm -hmm. But the dangers in my heart. More slice of life, but I'm glad to see oh. it coming back. 
I am so happy that this one is coming back. Uh, I'll definitely be reviewing this one as it, as it goes from week to week. Because this is just such a great rom-com. If you don't know about it, you should absolutely check it out. I One of the reasons why I really enjoyed it is because it takes... It takes a kind of character, a real type of personality from the real world of just angsty, dumb, young teen who thinks that they know everything, who thinks they're really cool, who plays into the whole angstiness and it's because they, because they have this, this weird idea of themselves against the world and, and it goes dark. Like, a lot of kids, unfortunately, go <laughs> and shows how that type of personality is redeemed through various actions, through various interactions. And there is a brilliant rom-com element that's woven on into that. And I like how the girl, uh, the main girl, Yamada, she's uh, displayed at first kind of like a bimbo. She's actually really intelligent and really cognizant of what's going on. And, uh, and you find out uh, as time goes on that a lot of the things that you thought were just like, oh, here we have just one of those dumb kawinky dink moments. No, <laughs> she's the mastermind behind it all. And I love it. I, I love seeing a rom-com where you have two characters that are active participants in the romance and not just one romancing the other, which is usually what you see happen. Right. All right, let's get into our new anime of the season. Just to point out, we only picked out like 10 of the new ones. There's a lot of new ones coming out. I'm particularly excited about like Metallic Rouge made by Studio Bones. That one's going to be interesting to watch. But these are ones that have like manga, manhwa, like source material we can look into and like examine and see if we want to take a look at it. It's just the way we've done this ever since we started doing the Need for Weed pre-anime manga review stuff. So let's get mm -hmm. started. Do you want to start from the bottom or to the top this time, Lars? Let's start off with the, let's start off with the bang right here with solo leveling. Okay, so I know there's a lot of people excited about this one. There's a lot of people really excited just because it's such a big manhwa. It started a whole ton of similar i wouldn't call them spin-offs copycats yeah copycats yes. is the word whole ton of copycat manhwa especially in like the korean manhwa culture and so mm -hmm. seeing this one finally get the anime it deserves i'm excited about it oh and i'm so, so excited, excited for this one as well i'm excited to see how they handle it just because I like soul leveling, but it's one of those that it's really good, at least in my opinion. It's really good until it's not anymore. And so I'm curious to see how far they're gonna take this. Yeah. And and what I'll say what I'll say to solo leveling is that within the context of the story of this of this adventurer who goes into the dungeon and uh, and and has like a near death experience. Uh, down in there this this is what sword art online i think tried to hit in terms of like the experience of the main character kirito being someone who experiences this near-death experience in a death game and then decides to solo level and then we see his adventures he progresses and builds his harem here in solo leveling is not so much the harem building as it is like here we have a guy who goes through this experience is traumatized, grows as an individual because of it, and we see why he begins to solo level, and the repercussions that, that come about because of that, the relationships that he builds, what kinds of things happen as he goes back into the dungeon in a, to both prove himself and to find that monstrosity that wrecked him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. So that'll be a fun one. There's, there's definitely a lot of hype going into this one. So I hope yeah. it lives up to that at the very least. What I will say, uh, well, I'll say though, because like what you said, Scott, like it's great until it isn't. In the very first chapters of the manhwa, like it is so gorgeously done. But there were already some warning signs for me reading it. I, I have not, I have not gone as far as you have in the story, but there were already some warning signs for me when there was when there was a notable drop 
the quality of illustration oh, about wow. six chapters in. And that's when you then realize that the that the author is really trying to just mainstream this to get as fast as they can on out. That usually says that the person had like a really, really great idea and now isn't exactly sure where it's supposed to go or how it's supposed to get to where they wanted it to. But they have to now but they now have to meet a demand. That's usually why I see I don't know if that's how it's gonna play out for solo leveling, but I've seen that happen before with other stories. Where I'm just like, like that but, for me is immediately a little warning but, flag. So solo leveling started as a light novel first, and what you were reading was uh like they turned it into a manhwa. So that may have been more oh, of okay. like a budget issue, if anything. Ah, okay, okay. Well, then I'll, see that alleviates one that alleviates already then one of my concerns. Yeah. Going forward with it, but like as I said, like I've seen that happen before, and I'm just like. Ooh, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> no. Let's move on to Chain Soldier or Mato Sehe no Slave. Oh, so, yay. I had a thought when I was reading this one. Mm -hmm. I realized there's several different reasons. Specifically in Japan, we, we mentioned before about it's about what the Japanese audience want and what the Japanese studios are going to make based off of that. And there's several different reasons why they'll make it an anime. You'll have something that just has like an awesome story or you've got like a great artist behind it. It's super popular in the Japanese culture. You'll have something that's pushed by like a really popular producer or director. Etc. So there's there's quite a few different reasons, and then there's yeah. anime made entirely for fan service and for the horny. Yes, and this is it. Yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, funny thing is this is that long before I knew that this was going to get uh, an adaptation, I'd actually been reading a fair amount of the manga. And what I can say is this, is that, oh my gosh, it's absolutely about the horny. It's all about the fan service at its core. However, there are moments that for me, I'm like, that was actually a genuinely good moment for the progression of the story or for a character arc. So there is some depth to Chained Soldier, but really people are going to come for the horny or the fan service. I'm getting real and, tired yeah. of the trope where it's like you've got some convoluted reason, no matter what it is, for one guy to move into a boarding house with a bunch of pretty girls. Mm -hmm. I'm a little tired of seeing that in manga, personally. And a lot of the time when that's happening, again, it's all for horny purposes. Yes. Uh, there's not there's not many instances where it where it is actually done for like a good story based reason and especially like when you stop to think about why this guy why Yuki gets chosen to be the slave of the of the main the main female character like when you stop thinking about it, you're like wait a second she literally could have gone and gotten anyone else other than you the only reason why you're quote unquote special is because you happened to slip through the rift when you did yeah. Which, 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 I mean, that also plays into the whole power fantasy idea that any regular schmo could just suddenly become super awesome, super important, be loved by all the ladies or loved by all the men if we flip it around to be for a girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah this is it, this is pretty shallow. Yep, I agree. I agree. But one that is not shallow yes. is Delicious in Dungeon. Oh, this one starts out as... It's supposed to be just like a fantasy gourmet manga where like you start drooling over the food they're making, even though it's from some ridiculous like fantasy monster. <laughs> and like they're pretty much giving you the recipe in the middle of this manga or anime for that matter. And I'm excited mm -hmm. for that part. But the further into the story you go, the less well you're still gonna get a lot of that uh -huh. but it starts becoming more about the characters it starts becoming more about a lot of the world building that was established really early on i'm seeing all this stuff that like from reading further ahead when i did the little reread like five chapters in i'm like that's foreshadowing 
also that's foreshadowing. Like there's a lot of like little tiny side notes that later on. Oh wow, yeah, that just blew up. So, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Uh, so, and the the thing is this, I actually I, so I read I read five chapters in, and then right before we started recording, like I went back for through the first chapter again just a little bit, and I I guess I just hadn't been really paying much attention to it, but. There's a real reason, like, why, like, there's a really good narrative reason why to play, like, into the whole gourmet style. Like, like, why are we talking about food so much? And it's because the hero screws up in the middle of a fight because he's hungry. And because, and because of that screw up, everything gets, all, like, all the events get launched into motion. And, and, and so, and so it's like, it's, it's a neat, and as the story goes on, especially, yeah, I'm not going to spoil certain things, things but like how the but, but like how it all comes back around to food yeah. and not and, and that there is a good narrative reason for why you should eat. What do we learn from actually sitting down and eating or from learning how to catch and prepare this food? There is a there is a great world building and narrative reasoning behind it, not just to be all like, here's this awesome dish that you should try at home. Just don't go try to kill your own basilisk. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our next one. Hokkaido gals are super adorable. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say right off the bat, here, here's my little note for this. Because this is getting animated, there is no longer an excuse to not animate Yancha Gal no Anjo-san. Uh, because that, that is the Gyaru Gal animate that we need uh, right here. This is going to be fun. This is going to be cute. This is this is the other rom com of the season that's going to pull people on in. Uh, but uh, but to me like the, but to me this is just like cotton candy compared to another gal manga that should be animated. I did actually find myself enjoying this one though. I mean, there's a lot of this made for that horny aspect we've been talking about, but. <laughs> Like, I actually like their relationship. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, I don't oh, think it's fun. quite the level of My Dress Up Darling, just because I love My Dress Up Darling. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a fun little story. Like, fun little, like, romance that's happening. Oh, it, it is. It is, and it, and it has, and it, and it has all of your typical uh, misunderstandings that 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 make things awkward and whatnot. Which I, I will say this: I love, I, I loved the uh, the igloo scene. Yeah. That really made me laugh. <laughs> so I, just yeah. like, I was like, because I because I was like, this is what this is an instance where you can absolutely understand the misunderstanding. Like this doesn't even feel forced, <laughs> actually. <laughs> And that really got that really got me going. <laughs> nice. And and I like and I like I, I like the wintery setting. The the yeah, wintery setting is perfect for a winter anime. So yeah, definitely. All right, the witch and the beast. This one's law more serious fantasy, and I'm excited to see where they go with this one. I really enjoyed this. I I kept on reading ahead. Uh, at, uh, after just the after just five chapters, because I was just like, "Holy cow, this is cool!" I I I like I I like where they go with the idea of witches. I mean, witches are witches are are a type of magical being that have been used so often throughout fantasy, and there's so many different things you can do with witches, and I think it is that. Recently, we've only seen either like really cutesy witches or just like really OP witches, almost sometimes too convoluted. Or characters you're like, why do we even call these people witches? Like it always seems like like I've been getting dumbed down ver versions of witches in fantasy recently. The Witch and the Beast takes witches, I think, to kind of those dangerous heights and levels of human complexity that that we've been missing recently in fantasy overall, yeah. not just in anime. Yeah. It was, it was really fun. Just a lot of great action, a lot of great intrigue. And, like, even though I only read, like, the first few chapters, basically... There was a lot condensed into that, and the artwork is really fun too. 
The artwork is phenomenal. And it's amazing. It's amazing all the information that's packed into just one chapter. Like when I read just like, I think it was like the first chapter. I actually, when I got to the end, I was like, wow, I just read, like I in the back of my head, I was like, now it's time to go to chapter four. And then I saw chapter two next. I was like, I didn't just read three chapters. <laughs> I, like, I was just like, I just got three chapters worth of information and action and character development in one chapter. <gasps> it's like, holy cow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, and then we've got more of a comedy this time. We've got Mr. Villain's Day Off, which it's set in this, like, Power Rangers world, but it focuses on, like, one of the enemy demon generals or alien generals one of those and he gets a day off every week where he gets to have fun go look at pandas and just relax and i like it pandas will save the world in this yes. anime I, I love his obsession with pandas uh this, so this is this is good this is this is going to be a feel-good anime to watch mm -hmm. right here it's it's funny it's cute and, it, and I mean, we've had other shows before that show the perspective of the villains in a Super Sentai setting, but, like, this is just, this is played up way more for laughs than it is for drama, and I appreciate that. <laughs> this will be the feel-good, this will, this, I believe, will be the feel-good uh, watch of the season. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Then we've got the wrong way to use healing magic. Yay, another pretty generic isekai. I mean, I like the thought process that went into this. Is like, let's make a unique character that uses magic differently. Basically, the character just learns to heal himself so much that he could just work out constantly and become super buff and OP because of it. That's the pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I feel like... I this one would do better if it had released possibly like four or five years ago. But now we're so yes. inundated with so many different like isekai stories that have the same now generic like settings and magics and worlds, etc., etc., etc. That this one's just gonna yeah. kind of fall under the radar. This one should have come out before Redo of the Healer. That I think nice. Redo of the Healer has poisoned people against yes. uh, against yes. stories about about the about the the, the Isekai cleric, mm -hmm. and and so I like and I mean I the Redo of the Healer is definitely not for me, and I thought this was fun and whimsical. Um, I, I I like his teacher more than I like the main character. Mm -hmm. I thought all of the isekai characters were really flat and bland. Yeah. I loved the side characters way more. Yeah. And and that's and that's not really good. That just again goes to show that you hear you have generic isekai protagonists. Yay. <laughs> all right. Let's move on to another isekai, the one I'm actually excited about. So villainous level 99. <laughs> yeah. The part of that is yep. I love the subgenre that it fits into because you've got the whole like shoujo villainous setup and it's along those lines of like you've got a dating game you've got the villainous and the villainous is gonna die at the end basically and so whoever is isekai in this gets thrown into hard mode and it's up to their decisions to get out of it mm-hmm and I like that kind of setting because it, it makes it more about the character's actions changing their fate than like just having to go along and react to the story. What matters most is what they're doing. And so it makes it a very fun way to go about this. And I also like how this one handles the OP nature of the main character because like they get super strong. They're so much stronger than anybody else. And then, like, they just don't care for the most part about the other people. They just want to live a fun life. They just want to live mm. the best life they can. And at that point... getting executed at the end. <laughs> yeah. At that point, the physical power doesn't matter. It's more their social ability. And because they've been grinding their levels for so long, 
their social ability kind of sucks, so they're having to deal with all of that, like as they get well, into the not, story. And it's not, and it's not just that she's been grinding throughout her entire uh, childhood and not grinding on on holes or whatnot, but <laughs> grinding in the dungeon. Uh, ah, which could also be taken wrong. <laughs> uh, you also have it where she's been isekai'd into a situation where. Um, there, there, there's a prejudice against people with black hair, and I like that the game. I like that the story actually goes into detail about why that is, and I also love like the dynamics of various kinds of prejudice. What really brought, what really sucked me into this story was how realistic the academy setting felt, and how realistic like the the society felt, and how realistic the uh, the political. Mm -hmm. uh, strata sphere of the of this world all works and how it all meshes together, and uh, and and I, I just I really liked it. The, the the teens felt to me like actual teenagers, heady and dumb. Some of them are smart, but a lot of the a lot of them are a lot of them are so preoccupied with their own life. Some some of the some of the teens that are presented as villains actually just end up just being your typical teenager. And I really, I really enjoyed that. And I also liked how, like, the nobility aren't, like, a bunch of scheming backstabbers. Like, there's, there, there's political maneuverings that are already happening in the early chapters. But there is order, there is society, there is propriety, and the main character has to navigate all of that stuff. And she's put at a disadvantage because her own parents were prejudiced towards her for having black hair. And so she hasn't even had proper social interactions with family for crying out loud and that was well enough explained for me that it works and so i really really like how everything just flows naturally in this story a little bit of a spoiler but i really hope the anime gets as far as the little baby dragon because i love that freaking little baby dragon so, <laughs> it's so cute but like it's also kind of evil at the same time and i love it yes Oh. There's a lot of fantasy this season. Like, I'm looking at yeah. the next three on the list is also the ones that we've already done. There's a lot of fantasy, which I love fantasy. Love fantasy. Yeah. I'm excited about it. Just, there's a lot of it. Let's move on to The Unwanted Undead Adventure. This was a fun read. Yes. This was a fun read right here. The one, my, my only gripe to it, and it's something that I didn't, that, that wasn't initially a complaint, like in the first five chapters, it was something that built up over time, is that it's revealed that the main character is like really well liked by the guild and that everyone looks up to him despite him being a weak adventurer, as rank really isn't any, isn't high. And it's sold to you at the beginning that he's like this worthless he's this worthless adventurer and and sometimes and sometimes that contradiction can be played out really well yeah. but it didn't it doesn't work right here it really doesn't i think that i think that had i think that had the manga and it might be different in the anime adaptation i hope the anime adaptation could improve on this aspect but if it showed him actually being a good contributor to the guild ahead of time so that way we get a sense of the loss when he gets killed. I think that that would actually hit way harder. And then you could then, and then I think then his, his, his struggle in being an undead monster from the dungeon mm -hmm. makes then way more sense and has, a, has way more emotion to it rather than it coming off first as a gimmick. Yeah. I think this one's fun. I, I like that it's, it feels like kind of a classic fantasy, almost like D and D fantasy setting, and it's like a darker fantasy. Like I'm so used to darker fantasy in anime being stuff like Attack on Titan and Tokyo Ghoul, stuff like this. I like the idea of this involving like more D and D s terms to it. Mm hmm. Yeah, fans of D and D, I think will will enjoy this right here, especially with uh, especially like with his loadout, with the gear that he gets, was very D and D esque, and I enjoyed that. And then let's move yeah, on it's, it's to one, it's it's one that I am looking forward to. Yes, I am too. Let's move on to Foster's home of imaginary friends. 
<laughs> basket <laughs> edition, basically. Yes, yes, that's what this is. Foster's home for imaginary fruits baskets. Yes, exactly. So it's called the Demon <laughs> Prince of Momochi House. It's nice to have a full shoujo like anime in here. I've definitely noticed, and I've seen several videos talking about it, how there has been a drop off of like full on shoujo anime mm -hmm. recently. And so it's fun at least seeing this one getting like animated. So I'm excited about that. And you basically got like a lot of classic Shinto like monsters and mythology thrown into this mansion that's a boundary between like the worlds of the monsters and humans. And you've got the two main characters like basically bound to this house for different reasons having to deal with like a lot of shenanigans on both sides it's fun yeah i i'll say i'll be i'll be forthright and say this is the story just wasn't for me i like rom-coms and there are definitely shoujo stories that i enjoy this one just didn't really click for me as i as i was reading it but i think that if you're able like as a viewer if you're looking for a fun rom-com this will this i think will will scratch that itch also the the boys within the within the mansion <laughs> are going to be eye candy for people so it definitely has that going for it and and the girl and the girl is definitely a return to the more classical ditzy fun loving silly protagonist uh, who kind of trips her way through the plot yeah <laughs> very literally at times and and that has and that has a real appeal, especially for people who are looking for a nostalgia to more to some of the more traditional, some of the simpler, some of the more fun anime of the past. The Demon Prince of Momochi House definitely has that feeling to it. Yes, definitely. Last but not least, we have Sasaki and Peeps, which <laughs> when you first start, like it's just kind of a quirky, fun like portal fantasy kind of setup but i i yes. feel like this one's a hidden gem it is a hidden gem there's mm -hmm. a lot going on there's a lot like even just in the five chapters that are introduced and so there's so much going on right and so sasaki and peeps for that matter is having to like navigate through all this and deal with it and it's very fun slice of life at the times until it's not, and it gets really, like, dark and emotional and, like, dramatic. There's some characters y you know you're gonna be, like, just fine with. Like, it's gonna be fun, like, more enjoyable. And then there's other characters that are just like, dang, I wasn't expecting that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, this right here, people are gonna call it Isekai. I would actually contend with how Isekai has evolved into its own genre at this point, that this is not Isekai. This is Portal Fantasy. This is what Portal Fantasy is supposed to be. Hopping between worlds, and the fact that you being able to do that as a character, or the character being able to do that, has massive consequences for that character, and for the worlds that they're able to go to and influence. Yeah. Like, it, 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 it hit. It hit in a way, like, in, even just five chapters in, within five chapters, I was like, I feel like I'm reading a, a variation of Beyonders by Brandon Mole, which is fantastic portal fantasy right there. Holy cow. And Sasaki and Peeps definitely isn't Beyonders, but it has that same portal fantasy feel. The importance of being able to travel between different worlds, the 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 balance between humor and horror uh, through through the various adventures and through the various characters. I will say that it has kind of for me it had a really slow beginning. I thought it was a little too weird and cheesy, but by chapter five, I was like, whoa, whoa! I was not expecting that. Yeah, <laughs> and that was good, and that, that that was a good twist. It's one I've been interested in because like i picked up the light novel at just for fun and started reading it and really enjoyed it so now i'm really excited for the anime to come out man there's so much to watch this season yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be hard it's honestly gonna be hard the ones that i know i definitely want to keep up with 
Delicious in Dungeon is might might get suddenly halted halfway through because it is on Netflix. And <laughs> yeah. And like what and like what happened with Zom 100, eight episodes in and then it just stopped for like two months. I don't even know why. <laughs> So Delicious in Dungeon might be uh, like might not be a great week to week viewing experience. You just don't know what's going to happen with Netflix, but it's definitely one that I intend to watch uh, as it premieres. I definitely want to see how solo leveling does. I know we've already talked a little bit about the story and what was some, one of my fears, like as far as the story goes, which you helped to allay. There is one other concern that I have as far as like the reception for solo leveling, and it has to do with the fact that Tower of God and uh god of high school both rose and oh, yeah. fell so fast and yeah. and i and i wonder if solo leveling is doomed to the same fate i really don't know i know it's being made by a1 mm. which like i've got nothing to complain about a1 they've had some really great anime in the past but they've also had ones that are just kind of eh at the same time so we'll see Honestly, crun let's see, Crunchyroll, is Crunchyroll um, really involved in this anime? I don't know. I, I'm right now quickly looking that up if I can. Because I think one of the reasons why um, God of High School and Tower of God ended up kind of crashing and burning was was in part because Crunchyroll like really, really pushed them. It was those Crunchyroll-made shows uh, back when Crunchyroll was trying to prove uh, their worth to Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Crunchyroll, it works best as a streaming service, not as a production studio. Yeah. And uh, they really just... I don't, I don't know how it all played... I don't know exactly how it all played out, but those shows just tanked afterwards. And the common, and the, and the common thread between them was Crunchyroll. Yeah, I hope so. they do a good job on that one. Delicious in the Dungeon, I'm excited to watch, partly because it is Studio Trigger, and Studio Trigger makes some fun stuff. Yes. Yeah, the oh, ones yeah. were all, like, they were all good studios, but nothing really popped out. And then the only one not on the list I already mentioned is Studio Bones making Metallic Rouge, but it doesn't have a manga or source material for us to look at. I'm just excited to look into that one. I'm definitely going to keep up with, uh, with The Witch and the Beast. I don't know if I'll be yeah. doing any videos on it. I might do kind of like a wrap up later on for it, maybe, depending on how it all plays out. But that's one that I'm really interested in seeing how people take to it. Nice. Sasaki and Peeps, Villainous Level 99. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two main ones I'm going to focus on, and then just some of the returning stuff. Yeah. I mean, really, we've got, we're eating good this upcoming season. This is. This is a fantastic lineup of anime, so there'll be a lot to talk about. <laughs> there will be. There will be. Uh, but, uh, any other thoughts? Uh, any other thoughts before we uh, wrap this up? I'm all good. Alrighty then. In the comments below, guys, we'd like to hear from you what you think. What are some of the anime that you're really looking forward to? And uh, what do you think of some of our uh, takes, especially if you've read further in some of these uh, manga? You can tell us if we're like, ah, come on, Lars, Scott, you're a little bit off. Or you'd be like, oh, you have no idea yet what you're getting yourselves into. <laughs> Always love to hear those kinds of comments. But otherwise, as we're waiting for all of these shows to drop and to enjoy them together, if you're looking for more writing advice, insights, reviews, analyses, and the likes, please check out our other videos here on our channel. And uh, let us know if there's anything in particular that you would like us to focus on as we go into the winter anime season. And if you'd like to support us any further, always liking, sharing, subscribing if you haven't already done so. And you can check out the books that we have released. Links for them will be in the description below. Otherwise, thank you, thank you so much for joining us on joining us on this incredible anime and manga adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, choose. Okay.